everyone my name is Evie Lupine welcome back to my channel and today I have another video for you all today we are actually doing a follow-up to a video that I did earlier this week talking about dominant pets because in that video I very briefly mentioned a little something called predator and prey and the more that I thought about it the more that I realized that there is just so much to cover in this topic and it really deserves its whole own standalone video, which is what we're gonna be doing here. Now, before I get too far into it, I should probably mention that what exactly predator and prey even is, is pretty controversial. Like, is it pet play? Is it animal role play? Is it primal? Is it its own thing? Nobody really seems to know. And so I am simply going to be offering my own personal best guess at what I think it should be defined as based on my own perspective, my own opinions about different areas of kink. And of course, if you think differently about some things than I do, you may have a different definition and that's fine. We just need to be able to have a sort of mutual understanding for the sake of this video and having a discussion. Now, as well, I would also keep in mind that the public kink scene, BDSM as a community, is still a relatively new thing. It's not even like a century old yet at this point. And so over that time, we have developed kind of core definitions that everybody sort of understands, like what is bondage? What is power exchange? But the newer and newer that terms are, the less and less consensus there is about what exactly that means. And so for as far as I can tell, the term predator and prey really only starts to come about at the earliest with the advent of the online BDSM community. Now, that doesn't mean that nobody was ever doing something like this before there was a term for it. They probably were just in one-off relationships and they probably didn't know that other people did stuff the way that they did and because there wasn't a community there wasn't really a need for any kind of widely understood terminology and so now we're still working on exactly what that definition is. So for what I see the definition of predator and prey to be is that it is a form of BDSM roleplay where one person takes on the role of prey and the other person takes on the role of predator. I know, it's totally revolutionary. I'm blowing everybody's minds with that definition, but it's really simple on purpose because what you will see is a lot of people online are very defensive about what this is supposed to be. And so you get a lot of people that make comments like, if you don't do X, it can't really be this thing. And if you do Y, it has to be something else. It can't be this thing. And it's like, we all need to just like chill a little bit. <laughs> it's okay if people do things a little bit differently. I know it's scary. I promise it's gonna be fine because the longer that I am in the community for, the sillier and sillier I find it to be that defensive over terminology. I think for me, what I value is having a definition that is clear enough and specific enough so you know what it is without being too exclusive where it's very 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 impossible to meet that definition and people feel like they have to do certain things so that way they can fit in the box that they want to fit into if that makes sense but i do think that things like sort of overarching generalities can be useful when it comes to understanding the motivation behind why somebody might want to do a particular thing. And when it comes to predator and prey, what a lot of people are really drawn to is the rawness, the realness, being able to be very instinctual with their prey or with their predator that they're playing with because it just, it allows for a very unique type of bonding and almost kind of honesty that a lot of other types of BDSM play don't really let you get into. A lot of people really value being able to have sort of the animalistic part of their brain 
take over. People find it very relaxing. People find it very cathartic to just be able to fully give into that because obviously in everyday life, we really, really have to sort of try to fit into a very particular mold, a very particular standard for what is socially acceptable. And being able to just totally let go of all of that obviously can be something that is a big relief for a lot of people in particular that might feel very constrained by those social requirements. Also, a lot of people really like how this allows you to really revel and explore sort of those very deep, basic, instinctual emotions. Things like fear that maybe are kind of scary to engage in on an everyday basis, but when done in a scene can actually be very, very rewarding. Now, with sort of the basics of motivation covered, I think the next thing that I want to talk about are sort of the key areas of play that you might get into to when you're engaging in prey and predator relationships or in individual scenes, just to kind of see if this might be something that's appealing to you. Now, the first number one thing, of course, I don't think should be a surprise would be role play. Role play is really the basis for everything else when it comes to prey and predator. And this could be on different levels, right? It can simply be something that is stated, but stays really subtle, right? It just, it sort of informs the roles you play in the scene, but it's not really something that you think about a lot. It's just sort of the framework that you go into a scene with. Other people much prefer to go all in. They really like the costuming, they like the makeup, they like the sounds, they like being able to be on all fours, they like having their use of fingers removed or tools removed. They really, really like being able to engage in a really deep way with the role play aspect. And for them, that's the most motivating part of getting to do predator and prey scenes or relationships. As well, this type of role play can actually come in a lot of different forms, no matter what depth you're doing it at. So the very traditional example is usually a predator animal and a prey animal. So like a wolf and a rabbit, but there's lots of other possibilities out there if animal role play isn't exactly your thing. So you might also do a human hunter with a prey animal. So maybe it's a human hunter pursuing a fox in the woods, but you can also flip this on its head and have a human that is being hunted by an animal like a man-eating tiger in the woods. It can also, <laughs> if you wanna go full the most dangerous game, be a human that is actually hunting another human. Number two would be rough body play. This is the thing that I think is most publicly associated with prey and predator, because if you have seen that happen at a BDSM dungeon before, it's probably been some form of rough body play. The most famous one would be takedown and capture and it is exactly what it sounds like it is. The whole idea is that somebody is pursuing their quarry and then eventually the quarry is taken down and then captured. For some people, what they're motivated by is they really like the rush of like being sort of pursued. They like being able to run around and resist. Other people really like having the struggle moment. So between <laughs> when they've been pursued and when they get captured, they really like having sort of an extended fight and a struggle and eventually being worn out before they give in. Other people really like the capture aspect. They're not really so much concerned with the details of like how they get captured, but what they are into is actually, you know, being trapped in a cage or a net and, you know, having somebody sit on top of them when they've been completely tangled up in rope or just completely pinned to the ground and subdued. And they really like being able to stay in that area of being captured. Along with that, a lot of people also like to play with sort of escape artist type things where the goal is to be captured and then escape and then actually be recaptured as sort of the grand finale of the scene. If takedown and capture isn't really your thing because it does take a lot of planning and space and other stuff, you can also do other areas of rough body play when it comes to prey and predator. Other things like just simple wrestling, for example, is really, really popular. If you like using tools as part of your scene, if that wouldn't take you out of the headspace, you can also do things like use nets or use hojo jutsu style bondage. And of course, all of this can totally involve other things like 
pulling hair or biting and scratching as well, which are really popular choices. Number three would be fear play. Now, if you are an emotional, a mental sadomasochist, I think that predator and prey is a really overlooked but very rewarding way to engage in this because when you think of things like mind fucks, mental sadomasochism, usually that requires quite a bit of pre-planning and role play and set design like you got metal tables you got handcuffs you got bright white lights because you're trying to set up an interrogation scene well if you are doing something like predator and prey you really don't need all of that and the reason why is because the particular type of fear that predator and prey relies on is a very like basic instinctual kind of fear. So it's very hard for like your conscious brain to override that because trust me, if you're in a dark room in a dark cage for long enough and suddenly the cage starts to rattle a little bit or you start hearing like animalistic noises slowly get closer and closer to you, like you can consciously tell yourself all that you want that it's fine, but your brain is gonna start making up stories all on its own. Even if you're doing something really, really simple, like maybe you have your partner where like you, you've sort of pinned their arms and you're just holding them and you have sort of your teeth like gently over their neck and you're like sort of maybe like roaring or like, I don't know, not barking, why, why would I think barking? Howling, that's the word. Sorry, I'm a puppy player. <laughs> If that, if I, dog would go bark, that's scary. No, it's not. <laughs> no, it's not. But if, if you like howl or growl or roar or something and you're just like very like close to their skin and, and they can kind of feel sort of the dampness from your breath on them, like literal, literal spine tingles, I guarantee it. So this can be really nice for fear play because it's just, it's so simple. You don't need all of the setup and the equipment and the pre-planning. And if you are somebody that really likes spontaneity, this can be an excellent direction to go, especially if you like also playing in those more mental areas. Number four would be power exchange. And I'm pretty sure this is gonna be shocking for a lot of people because people do generally consider predator and prey to be a very physical form of BDSM. So why would it ever translate to power exchange? Well, as it turns out, predator and prey relationships are simply another natural example of a pre-existing hierarchy like you have with caregivers and littles, like you have with masters and slaves. Like this is just one other thing to take inspiration from. And for me, what I like to think about actually is Legosi and Haru from Beastars, which sounds weird, but I love that show, but think about it, right? Because there's that sort of inherent tension between like the prey and the predator, but there's still a sort of like romantic aspect that compels them to be together. So if you are somebody that's very like romantically minded with your DS, this can be a really fun direction to go in. So for example, maybe you are a subservient prey animal that has learned to please their dominant predator. Or maybe you are a very sassy, bratty kind of prey that likes to escape and then be recaptured and be taught their place by their predator. When it comes to more like structure and rules, I think this is also something that works really, really well. You can do things sort of like what I talked about in the dominant pet video where maybe Maybe the dominant predator gets to eat first. Maybe the prey animal only is allowed scraps or second choices. Maybe the dominant predator gets sort of first pick of the human furniture and the submissive prey is only allowed on the floor or in a cage or on second choice pillows. Maybe the predator walks into the room first. Maybe the prey animal has to ask permission to speak or they have eye contact restrictions. There's lots of options out there if you do want to go in a more animalistic direction with your power exchange, even if you only want just a little hint of it. All right, for number five, we are starting to get into some of the more darker aspects of predator and prey because this one is CNC, which stands for consensual non-consent. This can be something that is really, really appealing and I think works well with 
predator and prey. But first, let me back up a little bit. What exactly is CNC? It's a little bit hard to describe, but essentially what it is, is it means that somebody pre-consents to have things happen to them that they maybe don't enjoy. And they essentially allow their partner to do whatever it is that they want to do to them. The way that I have heard it described before that I think really kind of helps it make more sense is I like it even when I don't like it and I want it even when I don't want it. Now, within this, there can still be some level of boundary. So for example, you might tell your partner that they can do whatever they want with you, but if you have sex, they still need to use protection. And there can also be things like safe words as well. And what this generally means is that somebody can struggle and cry and fight back and beg and say no as much as they want, but those things on their own don't necessarily stop the scene. What this can also mean is that you don't have the same level of pre-negotiation that you might with like your standard BDSM scene, which can really allow you to simply go with the flow and really read the energy of the scene as it is happening. Not only can this be done with scenes, you can also do it in relationships. And what that generally means is that in a CNC based relationship, you have consent that is given in a blanket way at some point in the relationship outside of some particular preset limits, and that consent isn't revoked until the relationship is over. Now, of course, all of this definitely falls under the realm of being a pretty advanced form of BDSM, so this isn't anything I would recommend to beginners, but I do want to make sure that people are aware that this is one aspect of predator and prey, so you kind of understand what exactly it is that you're getting into. And if you want to read more about this, I will put some resources down below that you can check out if you want to learn some more for yourself. Now, the very last area that I want to talk about is just, just content warning everywhere here because we are going down to the deep, deep dark parts of the whole realm of predator and prey. And I have avoided talking about this for the majority of the video, but going back to our Beastars example, obviously one of the underlying tensions between predator and prey is the desire to kill and consume and the desire to be killed and to be consumed. And that is obviously a very mentally dark area of BDSM to get into. Now, of course, this is all just in a role play context. This is not for real. Please do not do a cannibalism. I'm not advocating for that, but it can be very effective if you literally just like whisper something about this in like a partner's ear when you're playing. Ooh, again, spine tingles, okay? So, so, so effective in very, very small doses. You don't have to go completely <laughs> knives and forks out on this one. It can literally just be a consensual role play element and nothing farther than that. If you wanna go a little bit more physical though, Prey and Predator can also be a good option if you want to explore, for example, blood play, whether that be the act of drawing blood or drinking blood or licking blood off of your partner or just simply watching it run down their body. All of that can be very satisfying. And I think this offers a really good alternative to the very clinical kind of cold environment that is oftentimes associated with a more traditional medical play that blood play typically falls under. Now, if it is not in your skill set to do things like blood play and actually draw blood, you can also use fake blood as well. That is a pretty good alternative. However, I would also keep in mind that fake blood stains everything. So be fully prepared for that when you do a scene like this. Pretty much just assume anything that the fake blood touches is just gonna be done so. It's, it's gonna be over, it's gonna be gone. Say goodbye to it. This is a really great opportunity to maybe use up some of your old clothing that has like holes, rips, stains in it already and just kind of formally kind of say goodbye to it in a BDSM way, just as a final very kinky farewell to the clothes that have reached the end of their lifespan. Now, 
for just some general scene examples maybe. I will kind of give just sort of a rough example of how something like this would play out. So maybe you have somebody just going off of full on stereotypes here. You have somebody that is a predator wolf and somebody that is a prey rabbit. And maybe you have a friend that's kinky that has like this wonderful, really remote cabin in the woods that you can borrow and have fun without sort of alerting the authorities or neighbors to what you were doing. And so maybe you have sort of a scene in the summer and you're running around outside and the idea is that the prey has to go find a place to hide and then the predator has to find them and pursue them. And you have a chase around in the woods in your friend's backyard in their cabin. And then finally the rabbit is taken down. You have a little bit of a rough and tumble. You pin them to the ground and eventually you throw them over <laughs> your shoulder and you take them back to the cabin and you shove them in a cage, right? They have been thoroughly captured and you just allow them to sit there and stew in the cage. Maybe you have the fireplace and the cabin lit up or the stove and you have them watch it, right? And you have them like kind of get that thought in their head that they're going to be the next thing for dinner, right? Great scene, great afternoon, very active, lots lots of fun, can get dark in places if you wanted to, or it can just be very freeing and fun and relaxing if you don't want to do the last bit with like the fucked up fireplace thing. Sorry, I'm a sadist, I can't help it. I just, I just, I get these ideas. I get these ideas to fuck with people and I share them with you all. <laughs> and of course, definitely don't forget things like colored contacts or grunting or squeaking or howling. Don't forget things like eye contact. Don't forget things like body language. All of that can really take sort of the outline of a scene like this to the next level. But that is really everything that I have to share with you all today. Hopefully you found this interesting and helpful. If you guys have any other comments, questions, stories, ideas for scenes, anything you wanna share, go ahead and leave them down in the comment section below. If you enjoyed this, if you wanna see more from me, please do subscribe and make videos twice a week about all sorts of kink and BDSM related topics. And finally, if you really enjoyed this, if you wanna support what I do, the best way that you can do that is through Patreon. We are currently trying to make our way to 1000 patrons. And if we are able to do that, we will have a bunch of extra new types of content, other sorts of things I haven't really been able to make before. So again, please check that out if you haven't already. If you do already support me over there, thank you so, so much. It means the absolute world to me. And until I see you guys next time, I hope you have a great rest of your day and a great rest of your week. Bye-bye.